a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Novak, Gregory Stockel, Matthew Caputo, and Brian Lynn. Later, Katie Weaver and Ashley will present the next part in our series on America's national parks. But first, here is Dan Novak. Scientists are trying to learn more about microorganisms that turn snow red and might cause snow to melt faster. Recently, researcher Eric Marischal collected what he called snow blood from a mountain area 2,500 meters above sea level. Snow blood is a kind of algae that is red. Its dark color causes snow to melt more easily. Scientists are concerned that the algae are spreading. These algae are green, but when it's in the snow, it accumulates a little pigment like sunscreen to protect itself, said Marischal. He is the research director at Grenoble's Scientific Research National Center. He and his co-workers collected algae to study in the laboratory on Le Brevant Mountain near the town of Chamonix in France. The red-colored organism was formally identified and given its scientific name Sanguina nivaloides in 2019. Scientists are now trying to understand snow blood. Snow volume is decreasing because of rising global temperatures. This change in climate is especially affecting the Alps mountains. There is a double reason for studying the algae, Marischal explained. The first is that it's an area that is little explored, and the second is that this little explored area is melting before our eyes, so it's urgent, he said. Alberto Amato is a researcher at CEA Center in Grenoble. He said the volume of algae appeared to be growing because of climate change. He said algae grow faster with higher amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The research is ongoing, but the scientists say it is clear that the presence of algae speeds the melting of snow. That is because algae's color reduces snow's ability to reflect the sun's heat. Other kinds of algae, including a purple kind, as well as soot from forest fires, have the same effect. If the algae do spread, snow and glacier melt around the world could speed up. The warmer it is, the more algae there are, and the more the snow melts quickly, said Amato. It's a vicious cycle, and we are trying to understand all the mechanisms to understand this circle so we can try to do something about it, he added. I'm Dan Novak. Sri Lanka's Prime Minister recently said his nation's debt-stricken economy has collapsed. The South Asian island country is running out of money to pay for food and fuel. It is seeking help from neighboring India and China and from the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. Prime Minister Ranil Wick Remesinga took office in May. He described the difficult task he faces in turning around an economy that he said is heading for rock bottom. The United Nations World Food Program says nearly 9 of 10 families in Sri Lanka are going without some meals or otherwise decreasing how much they eat. 3 million of the country's 23 million people are receiving emergency humanitarian aid. Doctors are using social media to try and get important supplies of equipment and medicine. 
Growing numbers of Sri Lankans are seeking passports to go overseas in search of work. Economists say the crisis comes from in-country causes, such as years of poor leadership and corruption. They also say it comes from other troubles, such as growing debt, the effects of the pandemic, and terror attacks that hurt the tourism industry. Much of the public's anger has been directed at President Gotabaya Rajapaksa and his brother, former Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa resigned after weeks of anti-government protests that turned violent. The government needed to increase its income as foreign debt for large projects increased. But instead, Rajapaksa pushed through the largest tax cuts in Sri Lankan history, which recently were undone. Creditors decreased Sri Lanka's ratings, which blocked the country from borrowing more money as its foreign reserves fell sharply. In April 2021, Rajapaksa suddenly banned imports of chemical fertilizers. That move decreased the amount of rice produced and drove prices higher. This year, the war in Ukraine has pushed prices of food and oil higher. Inflation was close to 40% and food prices were up nearly 60% in May. The finance ministry says Sri Lanka has only $25 million in usable foreign reserves. That has left it without the ability to pay for imports or repay billions in debt. The local money, the Sri Lankan rupee, has weakened in value by nearly 80%. That makes costs of imports even higher. So far, Sri Lanka has gotten through mainly by $4 billion in credit lines from neighboring India. But Wick Ramasinga warned against expecting India to keep supporting Sri Lanka. The government is in negotiations with the IMF on a bailout plan. Wick Ramasinga said Wednesday he expects to have some agreement with the IMF by late July. I'm Gregory Stockel. In Naples, Italy, a debate has begun about the city's famous traditional food, pizza. Billionaire Flavio Briatore criticized the low-cost, simple pizzas of Naples. He called them bricks of dough with a puddle of tomato. The kind of pizza that Briatore was criticizing is called the Neapolitan Margarita. It is a simple pizza made of only dough, tomato sauce, cheese, and basil. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, aims to protect cultural arts, including cooking. UNESCO considers Neapolitan pizza making, or pizzaiolo, an intangible cultural heritage of Italy. That means making pizza is a skill or idea passed from generation to generation and important to Naples, Italy, and the world. Many chefs from Naples reacted to Briatore's comment with anger. Chef Sergio Macu, president of the Neapolitan Pizza Maker Association, said Briatore had betrayed the pizza's heritage. Pizza has fed entire generations, overcoming war and cholera, he said. Gino Sorbillo, one of Italy's most famous pizza chefs, also reacted publicly to Briatore's comments. He served free pizza in front of his family restaurant in central Naples as his answer. He said, 
low-cost pizza could also be very good. Briatore says that cheap pizza is not good? We make it like this. Taste it and tell me what it's like, Sorbillo told RTL Radio. Briatore owns restaurants that serve pizza that is very different from the classic margarita. This pizza comes with many toppings and can cost as much as $68. Sorbillo suggested that Briatore should let his cooks prepare food next to Neapolitan chefs in his restaurants, to let his clients, used to gourmet pizza, taste a typical Neapolitan one in a healthy challenge. The five major planets in our solar system have lined up in a rare formation that sky watchers can see with their own eyes. Astronomers say the formation is expected to remain in the sky through the rest of June. The planets involved are Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They are the brightest planets in the solar system. Seeing two or three major planets close to each other can be a common sight. But the American Astronomical Society said in a statement that seeing all five together is rare. The last time such a planet formation happened was in December 2004. The Society said the best time to watch the five planets is shortly before the sun rises. They will be stretching across the sky from low in the east to higher in the south, the statement said. Some astronomers are calling the event a planet parade. A map published by the Astronomical Society's Sky and Telescope magazine shows the planets appearing from left to right in this order, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Mercury will appear at the lowest point on the horizon. People in the northern hemisphere should look toward the east-southeast horizon, while those in the southern hemisphere should be looking toward the east-northeastern horizon. The planets should be visible without special equipment such as a telescope but binoculars will be helpful. Cloudy weather will also affect visibility, so astronomers suggest some planning for the best experience. If it's cloudy on the dates of note, you still have all the mornings in between to take in the view of the five naked-eye planets adorning the southeastern horizon, the Society said. Just make sure you set your alarm and wake up on time. Mercury is the most difficult to see because it is closer to the glow of the sun. But the other planets should be easy to see even without the use of binoculars for several more days. On June 19th, the American Space Agency, NASA, tweeted about the beginning of the unusual planet lineup. Look up starting tonight to see Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn spread out and appear to line up in the sky. NASA noted that on June 23rd, sky watchers got a special treat when the crescent moon joined the lineup. A crescent describes the shape of the moon as it appears early in its first quarter or late in its last quarter. During this period, only a small edge of the moon is visible and is lit up by the sun.
As June ends, the planet parade will come to an end. Astronomers predict the next chance to see the five-planet formation will be March 2041. NASA says June is also a good time for more serious sky watchers to observe one of the best-known globular star clusters. These clusters, or groups, are spherical collections of stars gathered closely together at their centers. They can include tens of thousands to millions of stars. They orbit the centers of many galaxies. The one currently most observable is called M13, also known as the Hercules Cluster. But the space agency notes that binoculars or a telescope will be necessary to see it. Find M13 in the constellation Hercules, which is high in the east in the first couple of hours after dark in June, NASA advises. A constellation is a group of stars that forms a shape in the sky and has been given a name and has a story behind it. The stars in M13 are thought to be around 12 billion years old. That is nearly as old as the universe itself, NASA notes. I'm Brian Lynn. Today, we explore a national park and UNESCO World Heritage Site in the American Southwest. This national park, near the city of Carlsbad, New Mexico, is unusual in a major way. It is mostly underground. Carlsbad Caverns National Park contains more than 100 caves below the surface of the desert. Most are closed to the public, but Anyone can visit the main attraction, one of the largest caves in the world. Huge, incredible, inspiring. Words like these come to mind as visitors enter a world of silence, darkness, and cold, almost 230 meters under the ground. An elevator lowers you into the world of Carlsbad Cavern. It is silent, except for the quiet voices of guides and visitors. It is not fully dark, though. The National Park Service has enough lighting to see many of the beautiful formations all around. The temperature in the cave is about 13 degrees Celsius. A cavern is a large cave. But Carlsbad Cavern is really a long series of chambers. One of these is called the Big Room. The Big Room measures more than three hectares. The ceiling is 77 meters high. The Big Room is the single largest underground chamber ever found in North America. The big room and other parts of the cavern contain huge, sharp formations of minerals. People are free to explore the lit formations in the big room, but park rangers must guide visitors to other areas of the cave. Stalactites hang from the ceiling. Stalagmites rise from the floor. Some even meet to create a column. Other formations look like needles, popcorn, pearls, and flowers. One of the first questions visitors might have is how did Carlsbad Cavern form? Guides explain that it did not result from the action of waterways like other limestone caves. Its creator was sulfuric acid. 
The limestone developed about 250 million years ago. Then, within the last 20 million years, movements in the earth pushed the rock upward, forming the Guadalupe Mountains. Today, these mountains extend from West Texas into Southeast New Mexico. The action of oil and natural gas created. Hydrogen sulfide in the limestone. The hydrogen sulfide reacted with oxygen in rainwater, moving through the rock. Sulfuric acid developed. The acid created the caves by dissolving the limestone in its path. Later, the water and most of the acid left the caves as the Guadalupe Mountains continued to rise. This permitted fresh water to move through. The fresh water left behind minerals. These minerals became the formations and shapes on the ceilings, walls, and floors of the caves. People are not the only visitors to Carlsbad Caverns National Park. About four hundred thousand Mexican free-tailed bats come from Mexico every summer to give birth in the big cave. As the sun goes down each day, thousands of adult bats fly out of the cave. It can take from twenty minutes to more than two hours for them all to leave. They go to nearby river valleys. To feed on insects, then toward morning, they return to the bat cave within Carlsbad Cavern. Park Service rangers explain that mother bats find their babies by remembering their location, their smell, and the sound of their cry. Mothers and their babies, called pups, hang in groups on the ceiling. They spend the day resting and feeding. While the adults go out at night for food, the young bats hang out in the cave for four or five weeks. Then, in July or August, they join their mothers on these nightly flights. Finally, in late October or early November, the bats all leave and return to Mexico. But they always come back the next year. It is possible that it was the bats that led ancient people to discover the cave. Archaeologists and others have found evidence of Ice Age hunters near the cave entrance. They have also found pieces of spear points left about ten thousand years ago. More recently, Apache Indians painted pictures at the entrance, and evidence of one of their cooking areas was found beside a nearby path. Around 1900, a teenage cowboy named James Larkin White began to explore the cave. Jim White told his story in the 1932 book. The discovery and history of Carlsbad Caverns. Here is a reading of his description of his first sight of the bats and the big cave. I thought it was a volcano, but then, I'd never seen a volcano, nor never before had I seen bats swarm, for that matter. During my life on the range, I'd seen plenty of prairie whirlwinds. But this thing didn't move; it remained in one spot, spinning its way upward. I watched it for perhaps a half hour, until my curiosity got the better of me. Then I began investigating. Jim White told how he built a ladder from rope, wire, and sticks, and returned to the entrance of the cave a few days later. Standing at the entrance of the tunnel, I could see ahead of me a darkness so absolutely black it seemed a solid. 
The light of my lantern was but a sickly glow. Nevertheless, I forged ahead, and with each step the tunnel grew larger. And I felt as though I was wandering into the very core of the Guadalupe Mountains. Several years later, in 1918, Jim White took a professional photographer into the cave. Ray Davis's pictures of the big room appeared in the New York Times newspaper. National interest began to grow. In 1923, scientists from the National Geographic Society explored the caves. The following year, President Calvin Coolidge named Carlsbad a national monument. Presidents can declare national monuments, but Congress must act to establish a national park. And that is what Congress did in 1930. Since then, parts of Carlsbad Caverns have been used for movie sets, weddings, even meetings of the Carlsbad City Council. Most visitors go to the main cavern, but some experienced cavers are permitted to explore five wild caves in the park. And in another one, scientists are studying microbes in search of a cure for cancer. As for Jim White, he became chief ranger of Carlsbad Caverns. In one story in his book, he talks about all of the work that was done in the area. I doubt if you can understand how happy this modernizing has made me. It's like the pleasant end to a dream. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Katie Weaver. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.